Uh, good evening. Thank you for coming here this evening and for whoever's going to listen to this podcast, though I admit I don't entirely understand what a podcast is. Uh, appreciate you all being here. I'm Charles Dobbs. I'm a member of the History Department faculty, and I'm honored to be one of the contributors to the new history of Iowa State University. We're here to discuss this uh, new history of our university, sesquicentennial history of Iowa State University tradition and transformation which Dorothy Sweeter and Gretchen Van Houten edited and to which a great many of us contributed chapters. I'd like to begin with a brief accounting of how the book came to be and get out of the way and introduce my colleagues who contributed chapters and let them all speak for a few minutes each and then turn it over to questions and answers. More than several years ago when I was still assistant to the president, I gave President Gregory Joffrey a memo about the upcoming, now it's really upcoming, but back then it was further off, 150th anniversary of this university. I suggested he consider what kind of 150th anniversary celebration he'd like to lead, and I strongly urged him to consider commissioning a new history of the university to update the work from more than 40 years ago by Earl Ross, a history of Iowa State College of Agriculture and Mechanic Arts published in 1942 by Iowa State <coughs> College Press. A lot has happened since that late Dr. Ross authored that work, and he also wrote in a different time, and we ask very different <coughs> questions today. President Geoffrey more than wrote to the challenge that I, that I posed. He asked the senior assistant to hear hear us, who was also an internationally recognized professor of personal finance, to lead the team, and she formed a committee which formed subcommittees, and hopefully you've seen at least some of the many activities they planned, including last year's Visha and all kinds of other things. If you go to the web page and check on the 150th logo, I say this because my good friend Carol Custer is there and she wanted me to say that. Check on the logo on the ISU website. You'll see all that is coming yet this fall and spring. Happily, speaking as a historian, I'm pleased to say that President Children committed to a new ISU history. He wanted a serious history with source citations. Everything you remember and dislike about college term papers. I kidded Professor Schwader that I had the most footnotes which I understand if you don't care, but I think it's cool. <laughs> he wanted something that would stand the test of time. To help ensure the resulting work would stand that test of time, he asked one of the best historians ever to work at Iowa State. I can't praise her enough. University Professor Emerita Dorothy Schwader to lead the effort, and Dorothy in turn got Gretchen Van Houten, the longtime editor of the Iowa State University Press, to sign on as co-editor. So some winters ago, a group of us met in Dorothy's house. Historians are poor and underappreciated, generally speaking, except, of course, by our provost and dean. At least we all think so. And so Dorothy bribed us with hot coffee, hot tea, and cookies. It worked. I don't think we ever left any cookies on the tray for Dorothy for the next day. That group, which included Dorothy and Gretchen, my colleague here this evening, Pam Ryan Kerberg, the former department chair, Andre Plotkin, librarian, Tanya Zonish Belcher, and one of our very best graduate students, Jenny Barker Devine, and me, discussed how to organize the book. I think we devised a very interesting, and I really believe unique, arrangement of chapters, something which virtually no other university history has ever done. We combined chronological chapters, the way historians like to proceed, with topical chapters, and we kept, spent a great deal of time thinking about who best to ask, or perhaps to beg, to contribute chapters. You can see some of the videos here. <coughs> we also have vignettes to highlight each chapter, and I think the vignettes alone are worth the price of the book, which, as you all noticed, is out there. For chronological chapters, Pam Riney Kerber, who's a professor of history, director of graduate education, and coordinates our PhD program in Ag History and Rural Studies, essentially rewrote and condensed Earl Ross's earlier book. Dorothy Schrader, again at the table, covered the period largely from the beginning of the Second World War through the present, to the presidency of W. Robert Parks. University of Kentucky historian David uh, Hamilton, who was also the late President Parks' son-in-law, wrote about the Parks' presidency. I contributed a chapter for the Eaton and Jishki years. Actually. Presidents I've worked for always said no good deed goes unpunished, and in my suggesting the book, they thought I should write about them. <laughs> President Geoffrey also contributed a chapter that afterward is summing up what we did in a look into the future. There were a great set of topical chapters. Tom Crochelle was one of the great people in ISU athletics. I have a long history of him and all the help he's given to my daughter when she was a journalism major here. A wonderful person who wrote about ISU athletics. John Anderson, who's now one of the president's assistants, wrote about cyclone traditions. Jenny Barker Devine, having written a history of the SAE House at Iowa State, wrote the chapter on students. Professor Amy Bix, a member of the history department, wrote about faculty. Peter Butler in landscape architecture wrote about campus buildings. And Joe Anderson, who received his PhD from Iowa State, and was on the faculty at West Georgia College outside Atlanta, wrote about ISU extension. 
I believe the book reflects a lot of hard work on the part of all the contributors and a tremendous effort by Dorothy and Gretchen. Several weeks ago, I was kidding Dorothy about that evening, reminding her of those meetings in her house, that she certainly remembered them. She said to me she was shocked at what she promised we would do. <laughs> and somewhat surprised we got it done. Well, it's done and it's out there, and I feel good about it. Pat Miller, who has led ISU lectures, well, just about forever. I think she's been there about as long as the <coughs> university. Organizes panel to discuss the book, so she could probably be up here and tell you everything we're going to say. And frankly, to help celebrate the institution and the absolutely wonderful people who worked here over 150 years, who studied here over that period, who just came to enjoy the university. So having said that, I'd like to go one by one with my colleagues and being the historian in chronological order, because I feel better doing it that way, which is also the order in which they're sitting. First, I just want to say who they are, and then turn to number one. To my extreme left is Pamela Riney Kerber, professor of history, did too many other titles to repeat again. In the middle is Dorothy Schwager, university professor of emeritus history. And on my near left is Tom Crochelle, associate athletic director for athletic communications. And so let's begin with Pam, who covers the oldest period first. Can I sit here? Sure. <laughs> I guess I'm. You're on. OK, all right. Uh, when the planning for traditions and transformation began to fall into place, it became my job to reinterpret Earl Ross's 1942 history of Iowa State College for a new generation. And you will notice that it is over 400 pages long. It's a nice, thick tome. And although our new history could have begun in 1940, it could have begun at the end of this book, we really felt that there would be a lot of readers out there who would have wondered what had gone before, what the place was like before 1940, and what changes World War II had wrought in the place. So my job was to take 451 pages to pick, to choose, to add, and to reconstruct in less than 30 pages the first 75 years of the <coughs> college's history. So that was my job. And I'd like to go on record and say that this history of Iowa State College is an amazing achievement. This is an incredible book. In his allotted pages, Ross told a carefully detailed and crafted tale of the founding and development of Iowa State. He examined the wrangling with the state legislature, the politics of being a university president, the development of departments, colleges, universities, and all of it with admirable detail. In fact, with enough detail that you could choke a horse with it. I mean, this, this, is, a dense, this is a dense piece of scholarship. And although he was somewhat light on their discussion, he did deal with issues such as student life. Uh, he noted the Spartan conditions of the early Iowa State College where student accommodations were, as he put it, primitive, but blueberry pies were abundant to the point of student boredom. Um, evidently, they had them every day for lunch and, and students got quite tired of it. He didn't avoid the unpleasant. He talked about the period, because of poor sanitation, the periodic uh, sanitary problems that resulted in student epidemics of typhoid and malaria. Um, so he did talk about that aspect of Iowa State's history. But in spite of his admirable thoroughness, I recognize that it was the admirable thoroughness of the first third of the 20th century a time when certain people and certain issues had yet, for the most part, to be discovered by historians. And so my job was to save what I thought was needed to weed out what I could send people to read about in Ross, uh, and then to add discussions of people and issues that didn't make it into this book, uh, or who made it into the text in very limited form. Because remember, this is a book of the first third of the 20th century. One example of this is George Washington Carver, arguably one of the most distinguished alums of Iowa State University. Carver receives a single mention in Ross's text as the winner of an alumni award for advancing human welfare. But perhaps even more interesting to a different generation is the story of the barriers that stood between Carver and an education at Iowa State. On his arrival, boys shouted names at him and the only living space that he could find was a room in an old office on campus. No one wanted to share accommodations with an African-American student. 
The dining hall manager would not serve him in any place other than the basement. Um, it was a friend's intercession that helped to smooth over some of his social problems, helped him to secure a place to live, uh, helped him to find a job on campus. And he worked his way through doing manual labor, sell, making and selling hominy to other students, uh, working as a masseur for the football team. And in spite of all of these constraints, Carver survived and thrived at Iowa State. Because of his skill in botany and horticulture, the faculty asked him to continue in postgraduate studies, and they appointed him to the faculty in botany. Upon completing his degree, he accepted a position at Tuskegee Institute and went on to great fame. But while Carver's accomplishments were unique, the problems of a student of color at Iowa State were not. The practical problems that he faced in finding a home, for instance, would not be resolved anytime soon. Iowa State would continue with an unofficial policy that barred students of color from living with white students until after World War II. In 1919, in response to a lack of housing for African American students, Archie and Nancy Martin, an African American couple who had moved to Ames from Georgia, opened a rooming house at 218 Lincoln Way. And because of Archie Martin's lobbying, it gradually became easier for African American students to find lodging, but they would not be admitted to the dorms until after World War II. This, of course, was completely off Earl Ross's radar screen, and fortunately is on our radar screen today. <coughs> Issues such as these have been firmly in the front, forefront of our minds since the 1960s, um, and so I felt like Carver's story had to be rewritten for traditions and transformations. And I think so too with the story of Iowa State's women students. Although Ross very clearly recognized the importance of co-education, and he also mentioned the names, talked about the accomplishments of many, many women, uh, I think in some ways his stories about Iowa State's women are a little on the flat side. Uh, he <coughs> doesn't, I don't think, pay adequate attention to the fact that Iowa State was one of the very first universities where women were systematically prepared not just to be better wives and mothers, but also to assume careers that would give them honorable support. This was a great concern of Mary Welch, who was, of course, the wife of the first president of Iowa State, but she was also, in her own right, a, a, an instructor here on this campus and a great campaigner for women's rights. And she believed that women should, yes, be trained to be good wives and mothers, but that they should also be trained to support themselves, uh, that they should have other opportunities open to them. And sure enough, a number of the early graduates of Iowa State parlayed their educations here into opportunities that nobody had really <coughs> thought that they might have. For example, Hattie Rayborn, class of 1873, worked in a number of offices in the state capitol, including being an assistant in the land office. Alice Whited, valedictorian, 1879, was a county auditor and eventually a state auditor. Several of the early graduates went on to become physicians. A number of them went on to own their own farms. Again, things that perhaps the state legislature wasn't thinking of when they began thinking about a school that would offer co-education. And I think Ross also missed out on some of the real fun of the fact that Iowa State was one of the first schools that had a large number of women students uh, here in the West. I think in women's campus activities, they in fact subverted the state's and perhaps the university's intentions for their ladylike education. And I think the best example of this may be that the Morrell Act in 1862 specified that land-grant colleges should have all of the men participating in military training. That was part of what the male students were supposed to do. Well, Carrie Chapman Catt, a suffragist political activist, early Iowa State graduate, also believed that there should be military drill for women. And they convinced the university that there should be a separate space for military drill for women and women on this campus engaged in military drill from 1879 through the 1890s. And although Ross does mention that the Iowa State women's military drill team participated 
in the 1893 Chicago World's Fair and, and did their drill alongside the Iowa State males, what he doesn't note is that they were the only women's <coughs> military drill team at the Columbian Exposition, that the audience was in shock and awe of these women, and there was a storm of hand clapping when they completed their exercises. And I thought that was really kind of fun. Uh, Ross mentions it, but he doesn't mention, I think, the, the, the sort of strange and wonderfulness of this particular moment in Iowa State history when uh, the women took something that was meant just for men and made it into something for themselves and went out there and subverted probably their parents' ideas too <laughs> of what was considered ladylike behavior. Ross also failed to mention some points of controversy uh, here on the campus, perhaps because they were too fresh, too painful, far too recent to make it into his book. And I think one of the best examples of this is something that Dr. Schweder has also done quite a bit of research about, which was Iowa State's experience with bovine tuberculosis testing in the 1930s. Uh, veterinarians at Iowa State were at the forefront of pushing for the testing of cows for bovine tuberculosis, which was one of the, the main ways in which the disease was spread to humans. And farmers were very much of a, a mixed mind about this testing. On the one hand, if their animals were tested, they could get a better price for their milk. On the other hand, if their animals tested as having tuberculosis, those animals were condemned, and they only got partial payment for the carcasses. Now, in good times, those losses might pinch, but in hard times like the 1930s, those losses could be absolutely devastating. And rumors began to spread that ISC veterinarians were condemning healthy cattle and selling them to meat packers in Chicago. Irate farmers hung veterinarians in effigy. They smashed their cars. Uh, Iowa State Extension personnel and professors were accused of, quote, preparing the farmer to accept the lowly position of a peasant uh, and told to try to run a farm of your own. They were forced to ask for protection from the National Guard when, in fact, they were attacked by angry farmers. Um, in the end, the veterinarians escaped unharmed, but the experience was discouraging and probably not the kind of experience, particularly not the kind of recent experience, that Ross wanted to commemorate. So rewriting Ross provided me a wonderful opportunity to learn more about the early history of Iowa State, but also to, to try and find the stories that were, that were buried here, that were neglected here, um, and to have a chance to rewrite these 450 odd pages into 30 <coughs> pages that might resonate with a different audience. You know, for a lot of the nuts and bolts, the details, I am happy to send people to Ross. Um, but in, in writing my part of the history, I wanted to make sure that there were other things that he perhaps wasn't concerned with or wasn't as concerned with as we are today um, that I felt needed to be discussed. Thank you. <laughs> you have to admit we did a good job picking the chapter author, didn't we? Pardon? I didn't hear you. We, you have to admit we did a good job picking the chapter <clears throat> author. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Professor Schweder. <clears throat> uh, what I would like to um, let's see, I guess I need to get this over here. Uh, primarily is to uh, reflect a bit on some of the decisions we made, some of the procedures, and um, not so much on the content itself, but um, uh, some of the decisions that I think were particularly good and um, look at it from that standpoint. <clears throat> First, though, I, I have to say I agree with Pam <clears throat> that this book, uh, Ross's book, is wonderful. Every time I use that book, I'm impressed more and more and, uh, and more. Um, I guess there are advantages of having been around this place for a long time. I remember when uh, Ross Hall, well, uh, first of all, I remember Earl Ross. I didn't know him personally, but um, he was this bent little man, 
and he walked around campus with what looked like a gunny sack. I'm, I'm sure it wasn't. But the sack slung over his shoulder, filled with books. And he sort of shuffled along, and he was on his way. He was always on his way to the library. And uh, apparently when his bag was full, then it was time to go to the library, turn those books in, <clears throat> and pick up and pick up new books. And um, he really was quite a sight on campus. The other thing I remember about Earl Ross was the um, uh, dedication of Ross Hall, which is, of course is uh, named after Earl Ross. And I still remember Robert Parks, who was uh, then president, uh, gave um, a talk, a speech. And one of the things that he said was, uh, he talked about the many, many talents of Earl Ross. Then he said that the man had a keen, sem a keen sense of humor that was not overused. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I thought that was really quite, <clears throat> quite descriptive. Well, <clears throat> I, I would like to reflect a bit. Um, I think the thing that stands out <clears throat> most in my mind, and Charlie mentioned this, the great wisdom in setting up a book review committee. When this project got started, in fact, it was first really initiated by the Sesquicentennial Committee, a group of about 28 uh, faculty members. And as I understand it, Pam, you would know this, you run that committee. Uh, the decision was made there that the Iowa State history would be the central <clears throat> project of the, um, of the Sesquicentennial. And, uh, so some of us were approached about working with this project, and uh, very early on, <clears throat> Gretchen and I were, had agreed to be um, the two co-chairs. I have to say, I don't think I stood a chance. Paul Lastly had me in his sights, and I don't know if any of you know Paul Lastly, but he pro truly, Tenacious should be his middle name. <laughs> and uh, I could have said no quite a few times, and it wouldn't have made any difference. So. I guess it was just easier to do, to do what I did. Uh, so Gretchen and I had agreed to be the co-editors. Then what really was the next step? Well, obviously we had a lot of decisions to make. We had 60 years of history to cover. How do you get a handle on that? How do you organize that? Where, where do you even get an entry point? And uh, Gretchen Van Houten, made a wonderful, absolute, um, very wise suggestion. She said, let's form a book review committee. And that book review committee was incredibly useful. Uh, like uh, Charlie said, he was on it, Pam was on it, uh, Andre Plockens was on it, um, um, uh, Gretchen and I were both on it, and, and Jenny <clears throat> Barker Devine. And like Charlie, I still clearly remember the meetings we had. And we started talking about a general approach. And then it came time, the crucial, crucial decision. What do we include in this book? 60 years of history. Uh, a home economics college that has been outstanding. A veterinary medicine that has been in the forefront. Um, a vet med throughout the nation. Um, great inventions that had taken place here. Many graduates who, um, who did extremely well, not only in this country, but, but in other parts of the world. <clears throat> the book review committee <clears throat> sat down and made the decision that we would have 10 chapters. Uh, I might say that we had two very firm limitations. The first was that the book be out by Visha of 2007. That meant we had less than two years to do this whole thing. Uh, the second stipulation was, according to the contract with Blackwell, that the book could not be more than 500 pages, typed, double-spaced, and that had to include any illustrations, any introduction, and that had to include everything. By the way, that boiled down to about 385 pages. So the committee sat down, 
we decided there would be 10 chapters and we decided what these chapters would be. I wrote these down and I, I'm not making this up with a rather <laughs> shaky hand <laughs> thinking, I hope we know what we're doing here. <laughs> I didn't sleep very well that night. <laughs> I kept thinking, were we too hasty? Did we really think this through? Have we really covered all of our bases? What have we done? Are we going to regret this? Um, <laughs> well, not so far. <laughs> um, anyway, the decisions were made, and, um, and, and I think it, it has worked out well. Uh, I, I'm really quite amazed that, uh, I guess we actually had two meetings, but uh, that we really were able to cover, quote, the waterfront, unquote, as, um, as well as we did. Um, I agree, again, with Charlie's comment that our dual approach was a really wise one. In fact, um, the longer that I'm a professional historian, the more I'm amazed at how often historians use this approach. They combine chronology and, top, and topics. Uh, many, many books are, are written with that arrangement, and in this case, it worked well. Um, we covered each of the administrations, and so there uh, we had four chapters that started in 1940, went up to 2000, and at the same time we had topical chapters uh, such as yours <clears throat> and uh, Tom Crochelle in the chapter on, on athletics. Um, so I think in this way we were really able to come away with a pretty um, uh, pretty comprehensive coverage. I would add one more thing that we did, and if Carol Custer is here, she deserves credit because this is Carol's, this was Carol's suggestion. This was at a later meeting um, in the president's office with Tahara Hara, Carol, Gretchen, a number of other people, and we were continuing to talk about issues with the book. And Carol probably felt, and rightly so, that all of this sounded pretty academic, all of this sounded pretty heavy. And um, she raised the issue, well, what about stu the student voices? What about having material dealing with, with students and their reflection on campus life? And this is what led to the, what we called originally interacts, now we call them vignettes, there are two of these, uh, two or three of these between each chapter. And I think it was a wonderful idea. It adds a light touch. Um, it adds a little more popular touch. And I think it does tend to balance off the ten chapters, which, as they should be, uh, were very well researched and, um, and really quite um, uh, readable, we hope, but still well researched scholarly, uh, scholarly pieces. So I guess, again, I would say with all of these things, the, the chronological approach, the topical approach, the vignettes scattered between chapters, uh, I think fortunately we came out with a fairly good, uh, fairly good balance. I think another thing that we did, and maybe this, we didn't accomplish this quite as much as we might, but I think we also ended up with pretty good balance in terms of social history, political history, sports history. I would like to think that there is something for almost everybody in this book. Um, Gretchen, who had many, many years experience at Iowa State Press and then at Blackwell Publishing, <clears throat> Gretchen kept saying when we were so concerned about tying each chapter into the previous chapter making sure that everything was integrated throughout. She, in her usually very direct fashion, she would say, well, you know, most people are going to pick up this book and they're going to go directly to one chapter. And we came to the conclusion, Tom, <laughs> that most people were going to pick up this book and either read the chapter on athletics or the chapter on student life. Now, I don't know if that will be borne out or not, <clears throat> but she said it's probably going to be very rare that somebody would sit down and read this book from beginning to end, and, and that's probably true. But I would still like to think that we appeal to um, uh, a, a diverse um, audience in, in the process. Um, 
I have to say that it did take some doing to get this done in less than two years. Uh, there were some pretty frantic times going through with the editing. Um, we had to go through once uh, the press had given out the galley proofs. I think we still had a process of going through those 386 pages uh, two, three, four times. Um, but it, I, I think it really stands as, as a tremendous accomplishment that we met that deadline. Not too long ago, I read a review of a history of the University of Oklahoma. And it made the point that this was going to be a three-volume history, which I think is very good. Um, I wish this project had been, had been that way. But then it mentioned that this was only the first volume, that the project had been 15 years in the making, and they had produced the first volume, which made me shake my head even more <laughs> and feel that this was um, <clears throat> feel that this was quite an accomplishment. Um, well, these are the main reflections. I, I would like to do one other thing. I think that probably all of us have a, a special part uh, in this book. One of the things that moved me the most, and it still does when I think about this, in writing about World War II, uh, I was going through um, archival material, and I have to say, if, if any of you have not experienced special collections at Iowa State University, you should. It, it's a tremendous, tremendous uh, collection, and, and the staff there, everyone is so helpful. But I was sitting there one afternoon <clears throat> going through a file on World War II, and I came across two things. First, I came across um, material related to the Ray Cunningham family in Ames. Ray Cunningham was a longtime YMCA director and uh, a very popular one. And the Cunningham family and the Schweder family lived just um, a block apart. And I knew in walking our dog many, many times that they had a banner, a very faded blue banner hanging in their window that had two gold stars. And of course, I knew what that meant. And in reading through this file in World War II, I came across material put together by the Cunningham family. They had, when the second son was killed in action, the first son, um, I believe that was in 1944, he was, a, um, uh, he was a medical doctor. And he was stabbed by a mental patient in a military hospital. Uh, the second son died, I think it was April of 1945. And, and, and the thinking that you're carried away with, you know, if he had just lasted a little longer. But he was a fighter pilot, and he was killed uh, in one of the battles in, in the Pacific. But the family had put together this little pamphlet, faded with time, uh, in loving memory of these two sons, handsome, good-looking, confident young men. And it, it affected me as well because I had four brothers uh, who served in World War II. And we had a banner hanging in our window at home with four stars. And fortunately, they remained, uh, they remained blue. Uh, the other part of that file was also very touching. A professor by the name of Mel House uh, he was a botany professor. And apparently, he wrote to a lot of his former students who were serving in the military. And again, this file bulged with material. And obviously, his students wrote to him frequently. And the letters were wonderful. One student wrote that, uh, in fact, a student in Panama wrote frequently, telling Melhouse about all of the fauna and flora, flora in Panama. And finally, this same young man ended up in uh, Japan, in Tokyo, very, very early, much earlier than, than he anticipated. And these wonderful letters would go back and forth. Uh, one soldier wrote and said that he was preparing turkeys for Thanksgiving dinner, and he was in Utah. I, I don't quite know how they worked that out. 
One young man wrote quite often, telling the professor about his activities. And then at the end, in almost a throwaway line, he said, oh, by the way, I just married the most wonderful girl in the world. Well, uh, it was a very personal side to, to the war. And uh, I guess that this would be my special part of what I remember from the book. So I think I better stop. <laughs> Um, when uh, I was in sixth grade, uh, I had a Stanford-educated uh, teacher named Mabel Ablard who had a lot of great effect on me. And uh, she loved history, and we had a project, and I had to write a paper on uh, uh, Julius Caesar. And I was told, write six pages. Well, I wrote 13, and I brought it to her, and she said, this is unacceptable. I said, six pages. I said, I can't put Julius Caesar in 13 pages. How can you do that? She goes, oh, you can do it. And so uh, she made me go back and, and do it. And I'd like to say that I learned from uh, that experience, but I think the experience was very similar this time <laughs> because I went through and, <clears throat> you know, I, uh, my manuscript, you know, I probably cut, had to, to cut 40%. And that was very, very painful for me because you were kind of crossing out the legacies of certain individuals. And it, it was almost a two, uh, you know, who necessarily am I to be the arbiter of whose story might be remembered 25 years from now when someone opened this book and read it. And for just a moment, those individuals were remembered. Uh, and I, I, that was by far uh, the most daunting, uh, you know, part of this, the, the most daunting uh, task. Um, I guess uh, going through it, um, and, you know, I'm sitting here with scholars. Um, I am not a scholar, and uh, I, I don't uh, claim to be one. Uh, but I, I am one who enjoys reading uh, the personal history of individuals, including uh, those who had a great impact here um, at Iowa State University. And I had read a lot of Dorothy's uh, books long before uh, I ever met her. That was one of the best things about this, was I got to meet her and I had, I had read a lot of uh, these books. But as I went through it, um, to me the, the, the overriding feeling was that these uh, individuals about whom uh, I wrote were such uh, reflections of their time. And uh, we were, you know, we were just talking about, uh, Dorothy was talking about uh, World War II. You know, World War II was a very, uh, saw many major changes uh, and wrought a lot of change in athletics at Iowa State because Iowa State University had the V-12 uh, program here, and uh, that was to make uh, engineers uh, for the war effort. Consequently, uh, many individuals who enlisted or uh, were looking to be uh, in, the, in the Corps of Engineers or uh, in engineering uh, were sent to Iowa State, including many professional athletes individuals who were playing in the National Football League, who were playing in the NBA, and at the time, those individuals could play for Iowa State. It was, it was fine. Well, uh, you know, we just interviewed last week Bob Mott, who played uh, on our basketball team that went to the Final Four uh, in 1944. And one of the reasons that uh, we had such a powerful team was uh, we got an individual named Price Brookfield, uh, who came and played for us. Uh, he literally um, came for V12 training. He met the train, uh, got on uh, the train with the team. They went to Lincoln. He scored 20 points in the first half, which at that time was astronomical. So Coach uh, Louis Menz benched him in the second half because he was embarrassed, and it's, it remains the biggest victory on the road in Iowa State history in, in our conference, in our conference. And uh, uh, at the same time, uh, the uh, Iowa State football program had a resurgence because of uh, these individuals who were coming to the, to the V12 program. 
And the longest uh, touchdown run in Iowa State history was out here at Clyde Williams Field when Meredith Warner took one uh, 98 yards for a touchdown. What, they, what people haven't talked about very much was uh, how he did that. We were playing Iowa pre-flight, which was the number one ranked team in the country, which was made up of lots of professional uh, athletes, which of course was why they were so good. And they were putting it on Iowa State uh, really big. So late in the game, Iowa State pitched the ball to Meredith Warner, and he ran 98 yards. And a guy from Iowa pre-flight ran right behind him, patting him on the behind the entire way for a touchdown. <laughs> and I, so I, but I asked the guys, I said, the, the, with these individuals, I said, well, weren't, isn't that, wasn't that kind of humiliating uh, in a way? Didn't you feel uh, uh, bad? And, and uh, he said, no, you have to understand the war was on. We were all on the same team. And they were expressing their gratitude because many colleges would not play them because they would be so outclassed. They were uh, expressing their gratitude for uh, uh, playing uh, this uh, group of um, professional athletes. Um, we were talking about just a little bit about uh, uh, places for African Americans uh, in the dormitories. Iowa State has our as some of you, I'm sure, know, uh, our stadium is named for Jack Trice, who was our first African-American football player. Came here uh, from Cleveland um, with uh, his high school coach, Sam Willeman, who, then be who was going to be Iowa State's head coach. Uh, he went, when he got the Iowa State job, went to uh, uh, the road crew out on the road in Ohio where Jack was working and said, I want you to come with me to Iowa State University. Uh, because I know, you know that you can uh, make it there. He knew he could make it there both uh, athletically and uh, academically. Um, obviously, Jack was a great player uh, for us. Uh, in 1923, he died uh, as a result of injuries that, that he suffered. But he lived for a time uh, in State Gym, which is still here built in 1913. Then for a while uh, lived in uh, a downtown Ames um, because yes, there was no place. And uh, the night before he was killed, Iowa State's uh, football team went to the Curtis Hotel uh, in Minneapolis. And uh, uh, he, uh, even in Minneapolis, um, it took a little uh, explaining from Coach Williman to get uh, Jack to be allowed to eat with the team uh, uh, even though the Curtis did, uh, uh, I mean, it had no uh, racial um, issues. Um, and uh, Bill Fisher, who was the last living teammate of Jack, uh, was with us in 1997 when we uh, dedicated the stadium uh, in his name. And uh, he said that when he traveled the rest of his life, he was a very successful businessman, and when he traveled the rest of his life, he always stayed at the Curtis, uh, even when in later years it w had lost a lot of its luster. He would stay there because uh, he felt it was a, just a way for him to uh, honor uh, Jack Trice's uh, legacy. I laugh about some of the things today um, that, uh, you know, uh, are being, uh, didn't have to be tried in the era of email, <laughs> where you hear everybody's opinion uh, all the time. Um, in 1931, uh, George Vinker, um, excuse me, came to Iowa State from the University of Michigan, where he was the um, assistant football coach and took over the head coaching job at Iowa State. Iowa State had gone 0 and 9. Uh, in 1930, although all the losses were, were close, they hadn't won a game, and uh, Noel Workman uh, moved on, and uh, Binker took over. Well, he felt that they, we needed a new look, um, that, that everything needed to be uh, kind of uh, redone uh, for the team. So we came out for the first game in 1931 dressed in the maize and blue of Michigan, complete with the yellow on the top of our helmets, okay? Now today, 
in the era of copyright licensing and everything else and email I, I can't even imagine you know just what we've just gone through I kind of laugh you know I think to myself we just went through whole thing with a new logo and some people really liked it other people hated it okay and they boy they tell you you know exactly what they're thinking uh, but you know although things uh, in some ways are different some things are very much uh, the same and then uh, after 1931 he felt that uh, we didn't need the 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 maize on our helmets anymore, but we wore blue, even though our colors are cardinal and gold, we wore blue through the Second World War. Um, because, uh, you know, once it was started, they, they people kind of uh, uh, stuck with it. Um, Coach Vinker, uh, one of his greatest days was here in 1934 when Iowa State uh, played Iowa. And there had been a strained relationship uh, between the athletic departments at both schools. But, you know, if you go in the library, there's a biography of Raymond Hughes, uh, who was president in the 30s here at Iowa State University. Uh, and it, it talked about one of his biggest struggles was uh, with uh, the Board of Regents and getting people uh, to basically, uh, in layman's terms, not in a scholar's terms, but basically to view Iowa State as a university in the same vein with the same goals as the University of Iowa. <laughs> and this was something he fought all the time. The book's in there. It's, a, it's really a fascinating book of his, of the things that, that he was trying to do. Well, in 1920, uh, the two teams had played in 1919 uh, and in 1920, and they were discussing whether they were going to play again. But uh, the Coaches uh, at Iowa State, the football coaches were also the baseball coaches. Well, the spitball was allowed in the uh, Missouri Valley Big Six Conference in which Iowa State played. The Big Ten did not allow the spitball. And so they kind of had to come to some agreement whether this, was go this pitch was going to be used. And uh, they could not really come to an agreement. And they had a shouting match uh, on the phone in 1920 uh, over this, and it led... Uh, in significant part to the series not being renewed again until 1933. Well, in 1934, the, the uh, Iowa came here to play and was a huge favorite. Uh, um, and uh, it was a great day uh, for Iowa State. Um, there was a huge buildup to this game because it had not been played uh, in Ames for, for 14 years, and then there was a break before that as well. Um, one of the fascinating things was just a couple nights before uh, Amelia Earhart spoke, came and spoke, uh, and the, the football team went to hear her speak along with a, a lot of people right here in this Memorial Union. Um, they played the game. Uh, Iowa was an overwhelming favorite, and the Des Moines Register uh, already had a, their front page all planned out. They had a big picture of Ozzie Simmons, who was the star player for Iowa. And they were all set to go with it. And uh, um, they played uh, the game, and Iowa State won it, 31 to 6. And uh, it was uh, just a huge victory uh, in magnitude for uh, Iowa State's program. But it was one that the register could just not believe was really happening. <laughs> one of the reasons they couldn't was that the man who wrote the story, Sec Taylor, was also officiating the football game. And so he could not really get up and do his story, of course, until the game was, in fact, uh, over. Well, now they're scrambling at the register because what are they going to do? They had this big picture. Well, the individual, one of the stars that day for uh, uh, Iowa, State was a, a freshman from Sioux City named Tommy Neal. And uh, so they frantically went back in their archives and they found this high school picture of Tommy Neal, which is all they had. Slapped it on there. And, uh, you know, we have at the, at the Jacobson building, I've got, you know, the front page. And uh, the, the, the uh, writers uh, and the individuals on the desk at the register who were for, from overwhelmingly University of Iowa graduates hung the picture they had of Ozzie uh, Simmons in effigy and he hung there above the slot where they would uh, put out the paper for several uh, years. 
Well, then again uh, came the struggle between the two schools uh, to play again. And unfortunately, uh, you know, this did not happen uh, again until um, there was threats from the legislature uh, to make it happen. And eventually the series was resumed uh, in, in 1977. Um, the last thing, uh, you know, uh, I was aware, having been uh, in Iowa, uh, basically most all of my uh, life after I left Chicago to come to school, and uh, women's athletics in the state of Iowa was way ahead on the high school level of uh, people around the state. There was not a state championship in basketball in my state, Illinois, until I was a senior in high school, 1977. Well, my grandmother played for the 1932 Sheraton High School team and complained until her dying day about her lack of playing time because she was only 5'4 and felt that the coach... Uh, uh, but the point was, it was an accepted part of life here. And uh, there was an individual at this institution named Winifred Tilden who, in 1904, under the title of Director of Physical Culture, began a program to involve uh, the women at, uh, at Iowa State University in uh, physical education and more than that, in actual competition against other schools uh, in sports uh, from field hockey to basketball to tennis. Um, and she did so through uh, 1944, was her last year uh, at, at Iowa State University. And if you go back and look at the bombs from those years, 20s, the, the, the teens, um, just go down to the borrowing uh, library right below us here in the Memorial Union, and you will see those, those women in significant number. And again, I think partially that was a reflection of how these women had been brought up in their culture. They were from these Iowa towns, not all of them, but many of them. And so when they came to Iowa State, it was not uh, some crazy thing that no one had ever heard of, of, of women uh, playing basketball uh, or golf or anything. And uh, I think in, in the way that she was a trailblazer, uh, her goal was to teach women sports that they could play the rest of their lives, like golf, swimming, tennis. And because she believed it was not just her job to uh, educate these women uh, on the appropriateness um, and the, the benefits of uh, physical uh, activity and competition, not just, oh, we're all winners, competition, winning and losing. And uh, uh, because she, she was a fighter. And one of the last things she did here at Iowa State University was bargain uh, at the end of the Great Depression for the building of a new uh, women's gymnasium. And uh, she pulled every string. And I gave my wife as a state legislator. And I gave her a bunch of stuff from special co uh, collections because I said, you want to read uh, something about uh, a woman who was a trailblazer and was fighting uphill because there were individuals in the legislature at that time who felt that women don't, they don't need to be doing all this kind of stuff. Um, um, but in fact, she found the allies that, that she needed and that uh, led to a part of what is now um, the Forker Building. So each of these individuals, as I, as I read, uh, they were, ref they were uh, reflections uh, of their time. And uh, even at that time, people could be brought together you know, in a unique way. Um, I just say in closing, um, in 1938, uh, we, had a, we had a great football team. Um, we had not done particularly well uh, after Coach Finker had stepped down to be athletics director. And uh, we were led by Ed Bach, who was an All-American for us. Our first consensus All-American went on to be president of Monsanto Corporation. And we had a little uh, quarterback uh, named Everett the Rabbit Kisher, who was from Albert City. And he went on to work for years 
uh, in Westinghouse. He's, he's still alive, living in Massachusetts. Well, uh, they went to play uh, Nebraska, and they were huge, huge underdogs. But they, they blocked a punt for a, uh, a safety, and they got a touchdown, and they won 8-7. Uh, to seven. And it was the first time Iowa State had beaten Nebraska uh, since 1919, and it was only uh, Nebraska's second loss in conference play uh, since the end of World War I. So the team bust. So they got on the bus, and they, they started driving back uh, to Iowa, it, it, through Iowa, and it's nighttime. And they noticed, they kept noticing all these bonfires as they drove along past these farms, bonfire after bonfire. Well, many of these farmers had associations with Iowa State. If they were not, in fact, graduates, they had learned a lot through the extension program, which bonded them with the university. And these farmers were doing these bonfires to show the team that they recognized what they had accomplished. And uh, again, that is, it's not that they won the game eight to seven. It's that there was this celebration that brought all these different people, uh, graduates, and it was crazy when they got back uh, to Ames. They, they, uh, got, the curfew was uh, lifted so they could be out all night. Um, but uh, it's just that uh, athletics was able to, in, in a way, bond all these different people who had other ancillary uh, connections to Iowa State that had nothing to do with what these other people had. It was just this celebration that, that brought them together for, for one night. And so, every, you know, athletics is not a world unto itself. It is really just a reflection uh, of its time as these people were. But they were uh, uh, great people whose legacy, you know, is still here. And that's the hardest part of writing is, is you know, whose legacy do you uh, remember and whose do you, unfortunately, because of uh, the logistics of getting it done, who do you uh, uh, forget? But uh, it was just an honor to be a part of it with you know, people like this because uh, uh, I barely got through my bachelor's degree, uh, let alone a PhD. Since I embarrass Dorothy all the time because of my respect for her, I want to embarrass Tom for a moment. He's far too modest. He runs one of the best operations to help out students at the university. Journalism students have to give what, 100 hours, 200 hours? Of some practical time? That's what we say. A lot of time. And if you would ever go up to the football press box, you would see dozens of young people better dressed than their compatriots anywhere else on campus helping Tom. And they start off handing out the halftime stats to all the reporters, and they're walking around handing them out. And then eventually he keeps a couple of them, and they get to do other things for him. So in one case, this one young woman got to write the football game day programs for every game one year. She used to brag to her dad. She had more books than him. <laughs> she got to be the sports information director for cross country and got to help Tom doing the NCA meet here at Iowa State. He sent her off as the sports information director for track, and she did the end. She represented Iowa State at the meet at uh, Fayetteville at the University of Arkansas. He does a remarkable job, and since it affected my daughter's career here, and along with the money he paid her, and Dad unfortunately he paid her the rack rate for tuition and didn't do the discount. It's a very stupid thing, Professor Hoffman. I know that. But I didn't do the discount. I, let her, I paid the rack rate for tuition. Let her keep all her scholarship money. So Thomas just aces up. I figure there's two things we could do now. I, I can bore you talking about President Jishby, who I worked for and liked a lot, and President Eaton, who I found fun contrasting what Martin Jishki used to say to me about Gordon Eaton and what the record said. Or we could ask questions, which I think would be better. This is a choice if you want to hear a lecture or get cookies. <laughs> I vote for the cookie. So if you have some questions, since I think we're trying to, whatever a podcast is, tape record this for some use, if you don't mind stepping to that there microphone, you can direct it to whoever's up here wants to answer it. Remember, historians get going with talking 50-minute bits, and you can't leave, so I would ask questions. <laughs> oh, dear God. <laughs> None? Yeah, I do. Thank you. You saved them. I was getting ready. I already wrote up notes. <laughs> well, this is uh, this is for Pam. I didn't quite understand.
understand what the veterinarians were doing there during the Depression years. Were they condemning animals and forcing them, or condemning animals so they had to be sold? Is that, and that it was questionable whether right. they should be condemned, was that? Well, their job, the veterinarian's job, was to go <clears throat> and to test the cattle for tuberculosis. If the cattle were clean, no problem, but if they were diseased, they had to be slaughtered. Um, well, basically destroyed. And the owner would only get paid a, a small portion of what the animal was worth. And what the veterinarians were doing was medically sound, it was veterinarily sound, it was what the state legislature had said they were supposed to be doing. But these farmers who are going broke right and left could only see a conspiracy theory in the whole thing. And this particularly happened in, in southeastern Iowa, where uh, things were particularly grim. And they were out there protesting against the veterinarians and trying to get the whole program stopped. Uh, the vets persisted, uh, and you know they were the vets were doing the right thing. Uh, it's just that that the farmers couldn't bear the thought of losing, in, in a time when they weren't even making the cost of production, they couldn't bear the thought of the loss of their cattle. And it turns out that one of the men who was most active in protesting this whole thing had a completely clean herd and nothing to fear from the vets. But he was really worried about what might happen if his animals were tested. And so that's what, and this was called the cow war, uh, and uh, was happening largely in the eastern part of the state. I, 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 something I asked Dorothy to comment on was where she wrote about Hancher and Hilton and their struggles in the 50s. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> Tom, you've mentioned um, about how, well, some of the um, disagreements between the University of Iowa and Iowa State in the athletic area. Uh, President Hancher apparently was just really, uh, and I've had people at Iowa State tell me that he was uh, just an, a, a very, very capable person, that he was a tremendous speaker, that he was very dynamic. And he also believed that, uh, that, that Iowa State should uh, be subordinate to the University of Iowa. And um, uh, when Hilton was president, uh, he first um, suggested that I that the state of Iowa should adopt a program or uh, a form like the University of California where you had a flagship university and then all of the other universities were branches so Iowa State would become a branch you and I would become a branch but and and they would have um, uh, well, they would obviously have, I suppose, provosts or the chancellors, but the president of the system would be in, in, in Iowa City. Well, he didn't get anywhere with that. And um, a second thing, a second thing, when, when Hughes was president um, or governor of the state, Hughes decided that maybe there should be <clears throat> um, some cutting of expenses. Uh, there was too much money was being spent. And it was really rather silly to have um, extension at Iowa, cooperative extension here. Iowa City had an extension service, and you and I had an extension service. So according to a memo in Special Collections, um, Hancher <laughs> uh, suggested that the University of Iowa would be the head extension operation and Iowa State would be secondary, and you and I would be secondary. And someone said, but sir, you know, what are you gonna do? Iowa State's a land-grant institution. And his response apparently was, well, that doesn't matter. We'll have the legislature change that. <laughs> so, uh, they're, they're, um, uh, I don't think he ever got very far in all of his efforts, but yeah, he, he kept trying. <laughs> Else. <clears throat> well, Professor Biggs is walking to the phone. By the way, there was a former member of the Board of Regents, John Tyrrell from Manchester, who always used to say they served the same meal every year he was on the board at Iowa City. He was so pleased that Iowa State would give him different food. <laughs> so there are better cooks here in Ames. Well, justified. It's one of my favorite times in Iowa State, and in fact, national history seemed 
what was happening on the home front, just some of the stuff that we didn't even get to, the way Iowa State is training women in engineering during World War II. But just for a different angle, I'd be interested to hear someone comment, I don't know which of you wants to field this question, for a bit of change of pace. I'd like to talk a little bit about what happens to Iowa State in the Vietnam era, because I think there's some very interesting things that happen here. I mean, okay, we're not UC Berkeley, but still, Iowa State sees a share of controversy during the Vietnam, participating in the national turmoil on campuses, the whole debate, whether it cancel classes after Kent State. So I don't know who wants to talk about it, but I'd be interested in just David talking about that. But we need David Hamilton. <laughs> Uh, and David Hamilton, uh, in his chapter on uh, parks, and uh, you, as you know, uh, Amy, uh, talked a good bit about um, the protests and the unrest. And I think the very courageous stand that President Parks took on, on this issue of coming out very strong and saying he, uh, you know, was opposed to all wars, and he. He felt that all of the students on both sides of the issue should have an opportunity to, you know, <clears throat> to express their view. Um, <clears throat> my, my family and I moved here in, <clears throat> in 1962, <clears throat> so we were here, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> during, uh, during that period. And the one thing I remember vividly, vividly, was um, a, a, at the Visha Parade, and I don't know the year, I think this would have been 1970, but I'm not absolutely sure on that. Uh, some of the anti-war students, students who you know, were organized and strongly opposed the war, asked if they could have uh, something in the parade. And the agreement was that they, they didn't allow that, but they said, fall in behind at the end of the parade in March. You can have your placards and whatever and show your you know, you can show your feeling. And um, I was a part of that. It was very interesting. Some women were pushing babies in strollers, and some people were older, and people had their, their placards. But I have to say, it was one of the most chilling experiences of my life. As we marched along, now I don't know how many people there were who supported the war, how many people there were who opposed the war, but walking along in that parade and looking out and seeing those people standing on the sideline, it was incredible hostility. It, it was hostility. I, I really felt very uncomfortable with it. Um, there, was, there were quite a few people at demonstrating, but my perception of the people along the way was um, very, very hostile. Just one more thing and then maybe. Uh, Don Smith, of course, was a student body president who was e elected. And uh, one of the, the stories of, about him that was just great, other than cleaning his motorcycle in his dorm room, um, taking it apart, washing the parts in, in gasoline and putting it back together, uh, different groups in town got on to Don very quickly, and they would invite him to come and speak. And he apparently was very happy to do that. Well, he had long hair at a time when most students didn't. And apparently he came to, I think it was the Lutheran Brotherhood or something on a Sunday night. And he stood up and he, he, he was, you know, a very bright young man. He was trying to disarm the, the group and he stood up and he said, well, hello, I'm happy to be here. He said, I just washed my hair and I can't do a thing with it. <laughs> well, it just brought down the house. Now, some of the things I remember. Anything else? Going once? Oh, good. <clears throat> Primarily observations because I came here in 1950. <clears throat> and I think, Bill, weren't you on faculty council that spring we had all of you? I was chairman that year. But what I want to look for, especially in the book, is the treatment to Dr. James H. Hilton. In my view, he was the turning point, not only in relations with the University of Iowa, where he taught hand you a great deal about working with legislatures. And the other point, I feel that he set the stage in which Dr. Parks made this a university. And I'm 
hoping that in the course of treating this history, you've been able to capture some of that credit that Dr. Hilton assembled while he was here. I didn't hear back about Dr. Hilton. Could, could you speak a little louder? I, I don't, that microphone's not working very that well. I think it's very interesting that the resurgence of that uh, war protest continued into the 90s with the Desert Storm era. I remember as a kid watching um, that same type of thing happening. There wasn't obviously quite as much hostility, but I remember that that was um, something that stands out in my mind as a kid watching um, watching Misha. Then on that same note, could anybody talk to the evolution a little bit of Bisha from, from 1922. I know that there's a lot of history you know, behind that, but I think just a quick um, synopsis of, of some of the really interesting things that may have happened um, along the way with Bisha, whether it be from, from 1922 or um, on or even 1941, which was obviously um, unveiled. Okay, you. Uh, I just have a, a few comments about Bisha, and that is that it was a consolidation of a number of events that took place on campus because there, uh, I, for, I think it was the engineers had their celebration on St. Patrick's Day. Uh, then the, the home economics uh, women had a celebration on May Day and a Maypole and, and all sorts of things. And every college had their own event. And the idea behind Visha was to consolidate these events and have one large campus-wide event. And I would really encourage you, if you get the chance, just to go up to Special Collections and take a look at some of those early Visha parades and the floats and the effort that went into those early parades really, put, in some ways, put today's parades to shame, um, especially some of the amazing, I mean, absolutely amazing floats that the students put together back then. Um, but it was an attempt to really showcase everything that was going on in the university to bring all of the students' to efforts together in one place. And I think probably on the part of the administration to keep the frivolity under control uh, so that, it, that you could confine all of the student energy and all of this excitement into one weekend instead of spreading out all of this throughout the whole spring. Yeah, it was also to bring students from all over Iowa here. That's right learn about something they might be interested in. Right. I mean, there was a really big attempt to sell this as the people's college and to give everybody in the state the opportunity to appreciate this place. And Visha was very important as a sales event, um, as well as an opportunity to let the students let loose and, and, uh, and enjoy themselves at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to respond to the comment about <clears throat> Hilton. Uh, <clears throat> I happened to write the chapter on Friley and Hilton combined, and I agree with you that Dr. Hilton uh, accomplished a great deal. And I think sometimes, and this isn't um, this isn't a criticism, because lines get blurred between administrations. But I sometimes feel that there were developments that people viewed as being a part of the Parks Administration, which really had gotten started and um, the credit belonged in the Hilton administration. Um, yeah. C.Y. Uh, C. Stevens and, and all of that. I mean, that was clearly Dr. Hilton's um, idea, his dream. Now, it wasn't really completed until Parks was president. But um, yeah, and, and I, I think there are other things, too, that, um, yeah, I think you're right. If I could pick up the Visha story, when I uh, interviewed you, I had a dot matrix printer at home. And I had made up a series of questions to ask the president if it came to that. And I was editing it on a plane flight, and I was so lazy I forgot to pull up. All, you're all too young with the perforation. And all this time. <laughs> well, being more just he goes, do you have any questions? I said, well, yes. We picked up this piece of paper that went down to the floor, and I'm running through them all, one of which actually involved then Dean Hoffman about my status in the faculty, and on and on. And the last question was, by the way, what the heck is Visha? <laughs> well, I am dumb enough to ask this several months after that year's Visha ride. <laughs> and I got an earful. Because one thing that Martin Jushki could do was explain himself clearly. 
very clearly, by the way. So at any rate, uh, by the time I started doing my chapter, which is Eaton and uh, just you sadly, an awful lot of what was the earlier view of Visha, that it was this opportunity to showcase Iowa State had become what it, what it is now, administrators holding their uh, breath because there was the official celebration, which is largely not a student observed event. The student brought it, but not observed. And the unofficial one that the university has been trying to control for more than 20 years, given the sets of riots. And the reports, if you read the post-riot reports from every post-riot task force, read the same, try and change it. And they read exactly the same. And sadly, there's a change in the nature of some, a minority of students, that they would rather do the rioting. You know, the, the one that I mean, Eaton was shocked by the burning of the couches on Welch and uh, Lincoln Way. And absolutely shocked, because it was just outside his sense of what could occur when I was asking him questions. And I asked about this, I said, how'd you react? He said, I was shocked. I said, well, then when he goes, no, I'm still shocked. <laughs> oh, finally, when you come out with it, you know, it, it took a while. I think, I think this year, Tisha also provided a little bit of a flips back in time, too, I think, with the 150th and the I And it was terrific, but again, what happens by day is not what happens exactly. by exactly. night, and that's, that's one of the yeah. problems, you know. I, um, remember the Visha co-chairs crying in 97, the year that, sadly, Uri Sellers died in, uh, on Welch in front of the Atlanta house. And, uh, you know, I watched, I got called in the office, and we're sitting there at 4 a.m. as Martin Jushki calls his parents. And that wasn't a hell of a lot of fun. Yeah. Unofficial, unofficial features. Uh, anybody else uh, going once, going twice? Well, then we're done. Eat some food, because otherwise Pat takes <laughs> <time to talk. laughs> Apart from the formal thing, I'm sure you can catch them because we're all old and slow and won't make it to the back door as fast as we used to in our salad days. Thanks a lot for coming, folks. Oh, but it's too. I love that. No, we're not. We're not going to do the talks on this. I always end up with. Yeah, it's a hoot. I had this idea of doing this. You know, ma'am, I'm glad that Pat and Mark both were organized. Oh, it was great. Quite just an hour to go about that. So how's everybody going? Good. We uh, but they were fun. We just had a brutal week. Thank you, Pam. Oh, you're very, very welcome. Amen. 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 Love it, Texas. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, you know the difference you made. Very good. Thank you. The difference you made in my daughter's life. I'm serious. Thank you. The you difference you made in my daughter's life. Thanks, Dorothy. And Thank the you difference you made, Dorothy. Thank you for your On my best day, not on my best day, not on my best day, not on my best day.